So allow me to welcome again uh, Stefano Rossetti from Nano of Your Business uh, EU, who will talk to us on the last lecture on tracking today the, on the um, uh, challenges of freedom of scientific research. So please, Stefano, thank you and go ahead. Thank you, Maria, um, um, and thank you, everybody, for uh, being here today. Um, um, you know, I will just uh, skip the presentations because I think it was already done uh, yesterday about me and what NOIB does. And so today we are going to focus on the, the, the general problem of online tracking that we discussed yesterday in terms of like general audience and general issues with specific regard to scientific research. Now, um, uh, to, to begin with, um, I, you know, freedom of scientific research is the freedom of researchers, so it's an individual freedom to express their opinion without being disadvantaged by the system in which they work or, or by governmental or institutional uh, censorship and discrimination. Um, the freedom of scientific research is obviously, is obviously very tied up with the freedom of expression, freedom of association, movement, uh, right to education, and, uh, and encompasses the right to obviously freely define research questions, to develop theories, to run and gather empirical materials, and to question accepted wisdom and bring forward new ideas. Um, and uh, like from this, uh, from the Bond Declaration on uh, freedom of scientific research, uh, you know, th th there is a, a very clear st statement in terms of like, you know, the conviction that critical discourses are not disloyalty, uh, but essential elements of a demo democratic society. And, uh, and obviously, you know, uh, just as it goes for the normal uh, public debate, for the normal, you know, freedom of uh, uh, discourse and freedom of, 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 of expression in the normal uh, democratic debate, it, this is in inseparable from a plurality of voices. And, uh, and, to, and it's very important to have a strong uh, legal framework in place. Now, uh, this is what the freedom of expression uh, and of scientific research is, what it should be, what it should stay. Um, and, you know, a, a little bit of a spoiler uh, alert and the uh, rhetorical question, because, you know, I'm a lawyer and I like these tricks. But the thing is, like, you know, how do these principles interact with uh, pervasive tracking, detailed profiling, uh, uncontrolled data sharing and uh, obscure content selection processes? Um, obviously, the answer is not so well um, for two main reasons. I mean, there are plenty of reasons, but the ones we are going to probably like, you know, quickly uh, discuss today are, you know, possible chilling effects on researchers and also the problem of structurally controlling the academic research uh, uh, chain, uh, you know, how, la how research is uh, performed throughout the different steps that are required. Now, staying with the chilling effects. Um, the, there is an interesting paper that uh, I recently read um, uh, from uh, Buchi and Festich and Laster um, about the chilling effects of digital data valence, data surveillance. And they analyze, uh, uh, you know, the impact that uh, um, uh, pervasive uh, surveillance are, are uh, you know, give on, on, on in general, on, on citizens, but especially also on researchers. Now, you... You, you have this problem that, you know, like researchers are obviously subject to environmental factors. And uh, obviously, you know, this, uh, the, the feeling of being constant, constantly tracked um, has a, a clear in, um, influence on the, on the possibility to freely communicate uh, their ideas, uh, especially those ideas that are out of the box, which is a very essential element for democracy, public debate in general, and in particular, the scientific debate. The idea that, you know, being, uh, there is uh, there is also like, I'm happy to, to provide the elements, like in case law, there is a lot of uh, elaboration and uh, theoretical uh, um, uh, theories, uh, like theoretical works in, in this field, but also like case law, trying to uh, basically uh, limit the chilling effects and of surveillance uh, uh, practices 
in, 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 in the journalism field, but also in academic research, especially European Court of Human Rights. Uh, the idea is that, you know, being surveilled, feeling surveilled, then bring to a sort of inhibition, both in terms of like starting your research, but also in terms of like, uh, you know, communicating, disseminating the information that you uh, like a researcher, a researcher may have uh, found. Um, uh, and then we have a, a second problem. Um, so chilling effect, uh, it's a rather individual uh, problem. And then we have a second one, which is a little bit more structural, uh, linked to the first one, but somehow different, uh, because uh, it has to do with the idea that, you know, uh, nowadays uh, editorial platforms are able to control and influence all stages of research. From the uh, you know the initial hypothesis to the collection and verification of data, publication and dissemination of results, um, uh, I uh, found uh, a nice graph, a nice uh, image. Uh, I hope everybody could uh, could take a look at could see it. So um, like it's um, it's these are the the, the most important editorial uh, platforms, and you could see for example that Elsevier. Uh, provides tools uh, or, you know, owns tools that are uh, used during the discovery part, the analysis, the writing, the publication, the outreach, and the, and the final assessment. And that's uh, the, 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 the same for Hotspring, for Microsoft, for um, um, uh, Cl uh, Cl Clarivate. More or less, all these big platforms are able to um, you know, are able to, uh, to, to exercise a control over the whole infrastructure, research infrastructure. And, um, you know, uh, they, 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 how do they do it? Uh, you know, they, they do it by deploying a range of uh, trackers, audience tool, web analytic tools at different stages. Um, uh, the idea is that, you know, whenever you start your project, your research project, you are possibly being tracked from the get-go until the very end of your of, of your analysis, um, um, just to give you like a little bit of a uh, an overview, um, um, the, the, all these elements are taken from uh, a very very interesting and detailed uh, and, uh, website. It's called uh, it's called Stop Tracking Science, um, and you know these tools do not only track researchers when they visit. Uh, the developer servers, but also when they use their research tools. So like uh, maybe like a, a, li a little bit of a, you know, reminder of what we did yesterday, what we were discussing yesterday about, you know, uh, cookies or mobile IDs, tracking IDs generated by operating system and software itself. Um, uh, you have, you have uh, like a series of actions that you are uh, doing, uh, you are undertaking with your, while using the software or the operating system. And all these actions are tied up to like uh, more or less unannounced and unauthorized uh, um, uh, tracking tools, unique identifiers that then you know tie your actions to your digital identity, and and then you know we will see uh, just uh, in a while uh, what sort of uh, uh, what type what type of processing they they undergo. Uh, but um, you know the, the in some cases I we we also found out that the, the you know big platforms are trying to convince libraries to install trackers within university networks uh, in in the, in exchange of some discounts for you know to to for knowledge access and uh, and this is obviously you know result uh, in a, in a real time recording of the researcher beha behaviors or whatever individual is using these resources now you have essentially three types of uh, trackers uh, micro targeting uh, that is uh, you know the, the data that the user uh, you know get traced uh, combined with data purchased by by different actors and then you know all these uh, these elements that we just mentioned, uh, you know, being elaborated through uh, unique um, identifiers or also fingerprinting, uh, is then is then condensed, is then transformed into uh, uh, data profiles by third parties, the data brokers, the ad tech sector that we mentioned yesterday. Um, and, and these are you know the, the these big uh, companies. Uh, you know these companies are getting bigger and bigger. There are several examples of data brokers that are. Uh, specifically work in, in the, uh, you know, in analyzing uh, research outcomes in uh, profiling researchers. Um, then there is also the so-called harvesting of uh, bitstream data. 
uh, collection of data running in the in the background of your computer and our applications, uh, such as basically called metadata. So this is uh, position data, IP numbers, device information, and uh, again, all these uh, all this metadata can be tied to a profile, to a specific profile. Uh, can be you know uh, whatever whatever the, the the this this group of actors has created about a certain research or a researcher and could also provide additional information to what uh, uh, to what we're doing and uh, finally uh, i just mentioned that a little bit uh, the troyans uh, that libraries are offered in connection with uh, discounts for other services and uh, um, this additional software basically makes all the uh, research activities uh, completely transparent and uh, also in terms of content uh, of what we are creating. Let's say uh, I'm, I'm not I'm not accusing anyone in general, but uh, uh, you know evidence emerges in terms of like uh, you know like writing software or analysis analytic software that not only share metadata, not only share. Um, ID uh, numbers or IP numbers, but also like the content itself of uh, of this uh, of this uh, uh, of our work. You know, like literally the paragraph we are writing. Um, um, just to give you like a little like a quick overview of where our data flows. Um, this is uh, like a rather simplified, I would say, um, uh, image of of like the, the attack ecosystem, you know. And then you have all these. Um, on one side, you have the advertisers. On the other side, you have publishers. I know that you, uh, in the, in the course of the previous um, classes, you have already discussed this matter. But just to say that whenever you know information and data is collected uh, from the researcher activities, from the researcher um, uh, computer device they're using, uh, more or less this, this data flows into this big system that is exchanged and, and then it's exchanged by between very, very like thousands of, of actors for different purposes. Um, so we have, uh, like, because of this, we have a, a problem, right? Uh, the, the problem of, like, uncontrolled data sharing concerning both the research itself, the content of the research, and the personal interests of the, um, of the uh, researcher. Um, major academic publishers uh, have made uh, a collection and trading of this data about uh, research interests and, uh, and uh, group and research institutions. And and it's becoming their main business model. So you you, you generally this uh, image concerns the uh, you know the ad tech in general, but these uh, editorial uh, platforms are very much part of it, and they exchange data just as uh, you know normal users. And what they do, we really don't know yet. Like we know that uh, it is possible that. So this use can be, uh, you know, uh, so this use can be abusive uh, in terms of like violating the intellectual, the intellectual property, the, the freedom of research. Maybe you you have an idea and uh, this information already flows somewhere else, uh, advantaging some some other entity, some other research center uh, that maybe is buying uh, or paying for for that information. Just to let you know that uh, as long as we don't know what our soft, the software we, we are using uh, is doing, we are exposed to this uh, potential uncontrolled data sharing uh, about uh, our research and our personal preferences. And then obviously uh, there is a, there is a, an, another problem, which is the problem of like the, the content selection. When uh, we reach a conclusion, when we you know get to a publication, uh, this publication is shown in you know a specialized search engine or you know uh, databases uh, for uh, you know sector specific and. Uh, the way this information is shown, uh, whether you know it's in the first place or not, uh, that has a lot to do with uh, you know sort of a black box uh, algorithmic decision making uh, that we are we have not really uh, a particular control over, and uh, obviously that also influences the way. Uh, you know, um, uh, scientific uh, research is uh, displayed and also how it affects the general uh, scientific discourse. Uh, so uh, black box culture and how it um, um, it uh, affects our 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 um, um, research. 
uh, to finalize it, um, we, uh, you know, these are the problems. And uh, uh, we were thinking, you know, like, what are the what are the options for uh, for the scientific sector to to uh, kind of improve this uh, um, uh, this situation to kind of uh, find fixes or whatever. So it's clear that as long as personal data is involved, uh, GDPR litigation is a possibility. But in general, like I would suggest a sort of intersectional approach. Uh, human rights litigation, for example, IP protection or sector specific frameworks, uh, and then uh, also like dialogue with IT departments. Um, uh, you always ask them to check what is actually being shared during your work. Uh, it's absolutely possible. There are, you know, uh, technologies at the moment that really make possible to see what sort of information is flowing from uh, like a specific application or an operating system to uh, somewhere. Uh, you would be uh, delighted to know that, for example, your uh, computer is making calls to uh, servers that are not necessarily, um, well, let's say, not necessarily um, specific to your, to your research, uh, but at the same time, uh, selling your research information, uh, either in clear in plain text or uh, in, in an encrypted fashion, to uh, third parties. So um, it is always very, very important to uh, liaise with IT departments so that um, there is always uh, you know, this possibility of being more knowledgeable, more aware of what's, uh, of what's going on. And then, uh, like this is a, a little bit of an input I received from uh, Professor Roberto Caso, who's a professor in uh, Trento at the Trento University. And uh, you know, a little bit the, the idea to implement open, transparent, and public infrastructures uh, whenever we are dealing with uh, our research. Uh, ideally, um, you know, these are open source uh, platforms that are verifiable, that, you know, uh, can, be, can be controlled. Um, the, uh, the, the also, uh, there is always, a, there is always a, a, a problem in terms of like selecting content and there, is, we, there will always be, especially, you know, moving forward, uh, like algorithmic decision making AI, but as long as we can, uh, to the extent that is uh, you know possible, kind of control this uh, black box issue, trying to uh, understand the logic involved in uh, these decisions and try to trying to uh, reduce uh, arbitrariness or you know incorrect results, that is already uh, quite uh, quite quite a result, and especially to keep data. Uh, that are, you know, preliminary to a research, uh, just strictly at the research center, uh, which is working on it. Uh, this is very important. So, like the idea that using software that is somehow uh, spreading, disseminating information, and we are not aware of it, uh, it's it's the main problem. And so, like uh, uh, open and public infrastructures could be uh, could be a solution. And then, in general, public debate, articles, uh, uh, contact with member of parliaments to show uh, as much as possible um, that you know there is an issue in terms of uncontrolled um, uh, information dissemination, uh, uncontrolled uh, AI decision making uh, about about um, our research. Um, so this is mostly it. I didn't want to, um, you know, use uh, too much uh, time, and I prefer to kind of uh, use it more for like a debate. Um, there is, uh, if I may, uh, just one thing that I wanted to um, add to it. Recently, uh, the Italian Data Protection Authority has um, uh, banned uh, ChatGPT uh, from mm. from the Italian uh, from you know uh, from from the Italian territory because uh, there is uh, the, the there were different problems. You know, like the data, uh, the, the 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 software was it was providing was often um, uh, inaccurate. Uh, there was no description whatsoever of what uh, you know where the company, for example, was getting the data from uh, uh, for to to feed their algorithms. Uh, the, there was no way for the users to object uh, to this processing. You know, to kind of say, okay, I don't want to be part of it. Uh, although you know, this is a right of the user. And uh, and also no age verification, which was a big a big problem, especially for this general public uh, um, uh, um, uh, platforms, because they are accessed by uh, children, and sometimes 
uh, profiling can influence their their lives. Sometimes people, you know, took their own lives uh, for for just uh, uh, joining some sort of uh, of uh, challenge on TikTok or whatever, uh, which was suggested by the algorithms. So you have a problem in terms of in terms of like controlling where the artificial intelligence is taking this data from. Uh, and you have a problem in terms of controlling the the processing of this data. Um, then the you know the for the first time the the, the company which is U.S. based uh, uh, liaised with the Garante and they uh, adopted some new measures to um, to uh, kind of uh, understand better and explain better to the users what sort of uh, what's happening uh, in the context of this of this ai tool which i'm, I'm quite sure is a rather simple ai uh, you know it's uh, just a simple uh, linguistic uh, uh, ai kind of tool but uh, and there's much more uh, intensive and much more um uh, worrying and concerning uh, software out there um uh, but the, there is a there is a pro a general problem uh, in terms of like how we um, we feed these algorithms. Um, since this chat GPT uh, issue uh, arose to the general public, we are annoyed. We are receiving a lot of um, input and uh, information from the public about kind of strange stuff happening, you know, like uh, people do not understand where that information was coming from or like why. Uh, the, the 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 software jumped to that sort of conclusion, which was right, but you know it never or she never meant to disclose. So there is a problem, and we 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 don't know the extent to which uh, like the the sources of this of these uh, tools, right? And uh, but we know for a fact that these tools are feeding on the ad tech, are feeding on large uh, data sets. And um, and yeah, you know, uh, we are we are feeding the system with all the trackers and all the cookies and all the fingerprinting operations that uh, you know knowingly or unknowingly we are kind of letting letting let to let that to happen. Um, so um, yeah, the, the I think it's very important to be aware of what's going on with the, the tools we are using and talk with the IT people, with the technologists, and uh, find out better, um, you know, what we're sharing, really. Um, it, it takes some time, uh, but especially for research centers like uh, CERN or other, other important centers in the world, uh, this is really the, the, first, uh, the first point to, uh, to assess the technological aspect, you know, what we are sharing and uh, with whom. And it's possible. There are um, instruments to track it. So yeah, Maria, I'm I'm done for. Thank you. That's wonderful. Oh. Um, we have time for questions. Thank you very much for raising awareness, especially in this place where uh, the experiment collaborations contain uh, four thousand people, some of them, and uh, these results are very important not to be. Um, misused, abused, and uh, hijacked. Um, let us, I, I'm just checking a, for, for questions or comments from the audience. And uh, we have Sebastian, who is also a security expert. Yes, Sebastian, please go ahead. Um... Hello, uh, Stefano. Thank you very much for this talk. Uh, it's not really a comment, but uh, sorry, not a question, but more of a comment. Or a, I'm actually really surprised with what you presented and a bit shocked, actually, or quite shocked. Um, how much this is known in the scientific or research community? Because that that sounds really bad. What you what you just described. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's I I thanks uh, Sebastian. I I think I think we are at this moment where we uh, look. I I've been working in this field for a while now, and uh, like whenever you 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 start in data protection and human rights in this field, you know the the first step is always you know trying to 
see, ah, okay, that's the uh, sort of uh, privacy policy provide all the information and or like was the access uh, request uh, uh, addressed in a complete and clear way. And these are more or less, uh, you know, checks that one can do on the scratching the surface of it, right? But then like when you kind of, uh, if you embrace the idea that you should really be in control of your data, as the GDPR says, and then you know, and you can just with a network analysis tool, you can see that, I don't know, simple smart TV um, is, is calling, I don't know, I think some 45 or 50 different servers sending your, uh, your data to whoever, you know, they have uh, decided to. And it's, 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 it, it's the same with research tools, with uh, writing tools that we, we use every time, you know, like if we get uh, to, for example, I don't know, some sort of grammar uh, check on, 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 a, on a document editing tool or like translations that we kind of, all this stuff is going somewhere out there tied to a specific ID, our ID, our digital identity. And so it's it's uh, it's rather easy for, for this system, the ad tech, especially because you have these companies in the middle, you know, called ID syncing, to kind of mix and, and reconnect all these different user experiences. And then you know that you are a researcher at CERN, but then you are also like, I don't know, like a, a leftish guy or an anarchist mm. that have this preference and that, uh, that other stuff you know it's uh it's uh, all out there and the the only credible thing i find uh rather than kind of well you have two options one is you know like going after this uh, multi-billion euros uh, industry and uh, have some general court declaring it unlawful which is not really happening the other one is to kind of really get rid of the trackers themselves you know that in turn allow for that sort of tracking, you know, just fighting against the object, object rather than the action. But yeah, and but but, but I guess you know, I'm I'm aware, obviously, and I think many people are aware after those four lectures, especially about the technical capabilities of you know how people can track us and what are the various ways and how those different organisms collaborate together. So this is let's say. Well, still very, very bad, but known. But I was even more surprised by the fact that, you know, and that the fact that, you know, your smart smart TV may be calling to 50 different services. As you say, this is unfortunately all true. However, you know, this focus on the research uh, community and the fact that um, this may not just, well, just not affect our private information or private life, but also our research. That is yeah. something in addition that kind of shocked me. So anyway, thank you very much for presenting sure, this. Sure, thanks for your question and your comments. Thank you, Sebastian and Stefano. Uh, Gabriele Tide uh, is our data protection officer. She was Hi, traveling Gabriel. yesterday and couldn't join, but she will watch the video. And now we are happy that she is back with us. Gabi, please say. Yeah, thank you, Stefano, for this uh, very eye-opening um, presentation you gave. Uh, I didn't. I wasn't able to watch yet what you said yesterday, but only today. I am really, really shocked. And uh, I think we have to discuss with our research community, in particular our experiments um, community, uh, and how far they are using such uh, platforms. I'm not aware. I haven't, I haven't been involved, uh, let's say, in any questions with regard to these platforms. And so, yeah, I, I am personally, professionally very, very much concerned about that. Um, with regard to the possibility um, to use GDPR litigation, I think CERN as an international organization is unfortunately not able to use this way because tracking and uh, tracing will not take place uh, in the European Union um, uh, regarding um, Article 3, territorial scope of uh, GDPR. So I think we, we cannot use GDPR litigations, but maybe we can um, look into other ways. So we have to investigate what is possible. Um, yeah, uh, thank you very much for this eye-opening <laughs> uh, presentation you gave. Uh, oh, no, sure, thanks. It's true, like uh, just a little note on the GDPR. It's true that in general, it doesn't apply, um, but uh, like there is this exception in Article 3, you know, whenever the uh, controller is targeting or uh, monitoring the actions of 
uh, like people in, in the European Union than the GDPR applies in theory, then you know the the interesting part is that we are getting decisions from courts more 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 actually data protection authorities and they say like yeah in theory we are competent but like these guys are in the US so we cannot really do much right <laughs> and they, they are dismissing the case so I understand but like, in, there is also like an op, like for example damages they could be they could be uh, awarded by like a European court. And uh, and also like in general, I think there is a there is a problem in terms of uh, um, like for them for these big companies. Uh, one of what they really want to avoid is bad is bad advertisement. Um, so like even if you get a decision that then cannot be really enforced, but the decision itself is saying you know like this data transfer was illegal or that tracker was not authorized, that's already a start. Um, to kind of uh, maybe also let other companies that are more GDPR compliant, maybe based in Europe, to to do the rest, you know, like, but just just my two cents. Yeah, I, I guess that those um, companies who provide these kind of uh, editorial platforms are rather US based or not Europe based. That means already that hmm, possibilities to intervene will be very limited. Um, yeah. So I, I, I don't, I honestly, I don't see it many chances to use GDPR. We, uh, Estonian is, is, is an international organization um, and we are not part of the European Union. So we're in Switzerland, so that means GDPR applicability in this case will not be possible. And yeah, we, which is a pity, I think, but okay. We have to yeah. think uh, about other means um, maybe to protect better ourselves. And no, I agree, I agree. And that's why I also mentioned, you know, this sort of intersectional approach, which uh, what, whatever works really yeah. <laughs> to, to reduce that um, problems. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, this is a very interesting uh, issue that uh, Gabi uh, raises. If we have data transfer, between CERN with this international status, not subject to GDPR, but with uh, another uh, local regulation, and the member states, which are all almost all, uh, in Europe, and they complain as uh, on the other end of the line, like they are European citizens, they have to be uh, benefit from GDPR regulations in this legal, let's say, dispute, who wins? Mm. Um, look, it very much uh, that then becomes a matter of uh, um, whether the GDPR applies and, and also whether it applies. It, it's a, a I, I couldn't really tell you. So the point for you, it depends, you know, like maybe you have a certain uh, researcher that is doing something from Germany one day. Exactly. And, yeah. Uh, and that, thousands like, of certain researchers uh, come or are paid for, uh, for uh, or, or work for German research labs and universities. Yeah. Um, it's a sort of cross-national, uh, extra mixed extraterritorial uh, problem. I think it would take some time to, <laughs> and I don't feel like I can give you an answer at the moment. Yeah, but think we, something really. <laughs> we we have sorted this, and in fact, out, Maria. We we can share with you our approaches to these kind of data transfers, and in oh, general, yeah. we we don't have, let's say, any legal issues with them. Uh huh. Okay, yeah. fine. Thank you. Um, thank you. The the other question I would have, just out of curiosity, the UN organizations are they subject to GDPR or or they are like us because they are international? Because the UN or uh, the UN agencies contain, for example, WHO, and WHO. Uh, can be a hub uh, or recipient, whatever you want to say, of scientific medical data. And there can be a kind of worms concerning uh, abuse or, you know. Yeah. Um, look, in general, I think, so the international transfers, uh, you know, should be 
So whatever, whatever data transfer is originating from Europe and goes to a third party, you know, a non-EU member state or international organization should be protected by these sort of safeguards, right? Mm -hmm. So like in theory, uh, I, I'm, I'm not aware of like any specific uh, adequacy decision between uh, uh, like the European Union and uh, these international organizations. It's a, a you know, profile I've never, because we mostly focus on <laughs> private enforcement. So uh, like against private companies. So I don't really know, but in, in is, you know, if you stick to the wording of the GDPR, that transfer should also be uh, under the same safeguards, more or less, you know, so the, the, the international organization should provide uh, protections, should provide, you know, like some sort of print data processing principles that are in line with European standards and all that. I don't okay. know, maybe, uh, Gabriela, like I, I, but I think... I think that's, Gabi, uh, you wanted to say something about this matter of uh, yeah. the UN agencies. Yeah, so UN agencies are international organizations like CERN, so in general they are not subject to local or national law. They, they have their own legal frameworks and um, in case, for instance, we have a transfer from an EU um, organization of personal data um, to that international organization, um, the obligations are rather on the data exporter side here yeah, yeah. to make sure that they send data outside of the European Union to parties that comply, let's say, with um, sp specific provisions of GDPR. Um, yeah. GDPR provides special tools that you can use, legal tools to legalize your data transfers outside of the European Union. And then it is up to the data exporter to see what is appropriate and um, yeah, and to evaluate if the data receiver is um, compliant with these kind of GDPR provisions. Yeah, so that means data receiver in a certain way has also to comply with GDPR. Yeah, but um, let's say not as an active party. The active party is rather on the exporter. They have to make sure that everything is um, is okay. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so correct. the responsibilities are on that side, not on the receiver side. These are like called in general that there are different ways, but uh, these are generally the standard contractual clauses. You know, like uh, these sort of uh, contracts that you have with uh, with a third party importer, and you have to assess uh, if they respect or ensure a, an adequate level of protection. Um, so that's a little bit. And if you know, what is the technical term, legal term, that covers, for example, the Italian government from prohibiting uh, chat GPT in Italy, given that for other countries or for other websites, this has been accused as a uh, violation like of freedom of uh, speech, expression, whatever. The Chinese do that and we say they are the devil. And we, we, I mean, how do we distinguish? I understand pedopornography is illegal and therefore has to be banned all over the place. But for other things, it's very complicated for me to understand when it's okay to ban something. Um, uh, yeah, um, you you have a, a big problem there because um, so the, the the in technical terms, uh, the GDPR adopt uh, the Garante adopted a, a temporary ban on processing, right? So they they communicated this ban. Actually, they did not implement it technically. So it was a decision from the uh, from OpenAI to uh, you know stop the, the the service from the Italian computers, so to speak. Um, and uh, it you're right. Uh, data protection is not an absolute right. It uh, has uh, a lot of uh, a lot to do with I don't know freedom of expression, scientific research. Obviously, uh, the final part of the GDPR, I think this one is uh, like the, the relationship between freedom of expression, scientific research, academic research, and data protection is in Article 85, I think. Um, and uh, it basically uh, tells, and uh, this article is a little bit of a more, it's, uh, it's, you know, the GDPR is a regulation. 
but Article 88, uh, 85 looks more like a directive. So the GDPR says it, it's on each member state to reconcile uh, data protection and freedom of expression by adopting national laws. So in theory, you have a law or a case law, uh, but well, preferably a law in Germany, Italy, Spain, France, whatever, in uh, that tells you like, okay, uh, this is not a case of, GDP, of data protection, or maybe in this case, uh, when it comes to training AI, because we think AI is uh, like a prim prim primary interest of the Republic, you know, the, the country, uh, you could also say, I don't know, uh, with regard to AI, uh, pro data processing, you do not have a right to object, or this principle can be lowered down a little bit. So the idea is that you have GDPR principles that in general are always applicable, but then for like under Article 23, and in this case, 85, for specific interests, a state can bring in laws to kind of reduce these protections and they must be proportionate to the purpose uh, you know they they have let's say i don't know it's uh, um, uh, security of the state national security or criminal investigations or uh, specific interests of uh, the state in uh, i don't know international trade whatever you need to have a legal basis for these uh, laws and obviously they cannot really deny the the data protection rights altogether uh, it's more of a like a sort of a, a balancing exercise that uh, you can put in a limitation, but this limitation must be uh, you know justified and strictly necessary. Okay. Now, uh, how that works with ChatGPT, I, I I don't know. Like for what I uh, you know what I think is um, if you look at uh, like there are two very concerning cases. Uh, like the the Garante was focusing a lot um, on the uh, children accessing these mm. tools, right? Mm. And there are two very very sad cases. One is uh, the case of Molly in the UK. She got uh, I think that was on Instagram. She kept receiving uh, like she, I think you know she was fourteen years old, uh, like uh, going through like a bad moment in life. <laughs> And she kept receiving, um, um, uh, you know, posts or advertisements regarding, I don't know, inadequacy or suicide or oh. this sort of this sort of uh, uh, problems. You know, I think she, they they filled her, her her mind up, and then she, this girl took her uh, took her own life. Mm -hmm. 14 years old, uncontrolled, uh, you know, content spread to children. The second one is this uh, little girl, 10 years old, in Palermo on TikTok. There was this. Uh, uh, challenge of like basically put a string around your 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 neck and resist as much as possible to without air or something and then she died 10 years old so the point was like you know please let's find a way to inhibit these services uh, to uh, children but in general and i think that concerns all of us vulnerable people because we are all vulnerable in different ways and different, you know, sectors of our own lives. And that's the big problem of, uh, of like this uh, high level, uh, you know, very precise profiling that uh, and content selection that we got. We risk to kind of live in a bubble, you know, and uh, and then that where our fears and our, our wrong convictions are confirmed more and more. And then, uh, you know, just uh, polarizing uh, the whole public debate, but also individuals' uh, lives. So that's a bit the problem. Thank you. Well, there are so many things to discuss. I think this can be endless, but maybe I, I don't know if other people would like to make more comments or ask questions. Or if you want us, we thank the, the speaker now and as he authorized us, uh, you can ask me for his email. He said it, he, it's okay for you to use it for future questions. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I'd be happy to, to help. So, you know, feel free to uh, send me a line or two and uh, I'll get back to you. Okay. So, formally, Stefano, thank you so much. It has been eye-opening two days. Thank you so much. You we shall be in touch. There are so many interesting things. Thank you for your so useful work. Thank you for finding time for us. I know you have meetings back to back. And uh, looking forward to another opportunity. Thank you.
Absolutely, Maria. Thank, thank you and thank you all for coming. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.